It has been said that a picture is worth a thousand words. I think I agree with that. Here's the picture. And now, the thousand words. I was reading an online publication recently, and this picture showed up to illustrate a story about a flight school. And there was a comment made in the online comments section about this picture that really disparaged this pilot. The commenter was essentially saying, what is he doing touching the propeller? Doesn't he know that's dangerous? Where is his CFI to stop him? Well, I'm here to tell you, there are a lot of good reasons to touch a propeller. As a matter of fact, there are reasons you must touch a propeller if you want to fly safely. We're going to cover a few of those, but let me just start with the big overarching message. You should respect the propeller, but you should not fear it. It's just part of a machine, and if you know how the machine works, you can do this perfectly safely. This is an old belief, and it is kind of an old wives' tale that you should never touch a propeller. Incidentally, as long as you're here and I'm here and we're talking about fabulous aeronautical topics, why not go ahead and click the like button and maybe even go big time and subscribe to the channel. We would love to have you on board on a permanent basis. Propellers do spin. They spin at high speed. They can do a lot of damage to an individual, including kill them if you're not careful. But to tell people not to touch a propeller is to misunderstand how that engine and propeller system works. Here's a great example. I used to rebuild warbirds a long time ago. World War II aircraft, I was part of rebuilding a B-17, got to work on a P-40, got a little bit of work on a Corsair, all kinds of great airplanes that had radial engines. And if you have a radial engine, you're going to have to touch the propeller whenever you go fly. In the case of a World War II airplane, those engines and propellers are so large, you're going to need a few friends. Here's a great example of what I'm talking about that comes from the Champaign Aviation Museum channel right here on YouTube, where they demonstrate how you walk through the propeller on a B-25. You see, on a radial engine, it's a dry sump. When you shut the engine down, there's still oil in the engine. And where's that oil going to go? Down. So that oil, whatever is left, is going to find its way into the bottom cylinders. Now, air is compressible. Oil is not. So we have to walk that propeller through before we even think about starting the airplane so we can make every piston go in and out of its associated cylinder to make sure we don't have a hydraulic lock, which means maybe there's an inch of oil on the bottom of that lower cylinder. And when that piston hits the oil, it's going to come to a dead stop. If it's just some people walking it through, they feel that we can remove a spark plug, drain the oil out, and now that airplane is safe to fly. But if we were to just hit the starter, we're going to shatter that connecting rod. We're going to do an enormous amount of damage to that engine. So in that case, with a radial engine, you have to touch the propeller. Now, it would be wise to make sure that the mags are off. And that's why the ground crew and the flight crew want to work together to make sure everything is correct. And that's true on your little Piper Cub or your Cessna or whatever else you've got that you might be touching the propeller, not just walking it through. But if you move that propeller even an inch, you want to make sure the mags are actually off. And you might want to get into the practice of doing a mag check before you shut down each and every time. That's a fairly simple process. When you get back to the barn at the end of your flight and you're getting ready to put the airplane away, before you shut down, come back to idle. Take a moment and shut your mags completely off and then turn them right back on again. You want to do this at a very low throttle setting. You want to be at idle or really down there. You don't want to do this at a higher setting. If you turn your mags off and the engine continues to run, you have a broken P-lead. You're going to want to deal with that because that means your propeller is hot all the time. That engine is ready to start. And if you move that propeller just a little bit and the impulse coupling catches, that airplane could start. At least it could turn a couple blades and that would be exciting. Way more than you need. Along that same line though, there are a lot of airplanes out there in the market built in the 30s and 40s and after, that don't have electrical systems. They don't have starters. The way we start those airplanes is by hand propping them. Now, when I owned the Cub, I always hand propped it from behind. I would chalk the right main with my left foot. 
I would have my hand up on the prop and my other hand right there to dive in and get the throttle or the mags if I need to. I could flip that prop from the back side. I was really in a very safe position. I'm on the back side. The airplane's not going to go very far because the wheel is chocked and I've got the throttle closed. So it's only going to be running it. 600 rpms i have plenty of time to make sure the throttle is retarded and if there's a problem i can just shut those mags off right away here's a great example of real world hand propping of a luscomb right here on youtube on the arrow work channel now you'll notice he flips the prop through a few times and it doesn't start that's not a failure he's flipping that prop through to circulate oil and prime the carburetor once that's been done after three or four circuits around the pilot will turn the mags on, he flips the prop, and boom, it fires off and goes. It's a very safe process, and you might even notice this young guy swings his right leg in such a way that the inertia takes him away from the propeller arc. That's a really good idea. If you can't hand prop from behind the prop, being able to use your body weight to carry you away from that arc is a really smart move. Now back to the picture that started all of this. This young man is holding the propeller and you'll notice the other young man on the right seems to be messing around at the cowl. This is a Vans RV12. It uses a Rotax 912 engine, which is entirely different than the Lycomings and Continentals and Franklins you might be used to if you're in my age bracket. Unlike those Continentals, Lycomings, and Franklins, where we can just unscrew the dipstick, pull it out, and check the oil level, a Rotax needs to be burped first. Check out this clip from the Sky Girl channel. Again, right here on YouTube, it's well worth a watch. We actually have to move the propeller by hand in the direction of rotation. Big caution. You don't want to turn a Rotax engine propeller the opposite way. That would be what we call in the trade very, very bad. But if we turn that propeller in the direction of rotation, and it may take several times, that engine is going to make a gurgling sound through the oil system. That tells us our oil system is now in a position to have its level checked and give us an accurate indication. So the upshot of all this is there's a really good reason to touch a propeller whether you're a pilot or a maintenance professional. There are plenty of reasons why you might want to or have to move the propeller on an airplane. The key is to make sure your mags are off, that the P-lead is not broken because you're smart and you do mag checks, and you're very cautious when you do it with the awareness that if that engine fires up, you don't want to be in that propeller arc because you can get hurt. The key is you want to respect the propeller. You want to know what can happen, and you want to take precautions to prevent any injuries. But you also don't want to be afraid of the propeller, because if you were to try and fire up an airplane with a radial engine without walking the prop through first, that might be a very, very expensive mistake. If you own a Cub or a Champ or a T-Craft or any one of a number of craft that don't have electrical systems, and you don't ever touch the prop, you're not going flying. That's how you start it. The process is basically like popping the clutch in your old 1963 Ford Fairlane. You just put the car in second gear, push the clutch in, get your buddies to push you down the driveway, and then you pop the clutch out. The motion of the car kicks into the clutch and the engine, it turns the engine over, and now you're running. But we do it with the propeller. Be aware. That's a real thing. That's not somebody being a crazy person. That's how you get the airplane started. And of course... If you've got an airplane with a Rotex 912, you're going to be touching the propeller to burp it. So don't overreact when you see a picture or when you're out on the ramp and you see somebody moving a propeller. That may be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Of course, having said that, don't just walk up to some stranger's airplane and move the propeller because you feel like it, because you don't know if they did a mag check. You don't know if the P-lead is broken, and you really might make some enemies if that thing starts and then skitters across the ramp and crashes into a hangar. You don't want to be that person. Thanks so much for watching. I know it's a little weird, but this is a real topic. There are people who honestly believe you should never touch a propeller, and with certain caveats to that idea, I'm going to say they're incorrect. It may be okay. It may actually be necessary. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Always great to have you here. Come on back next week and check us out right here at Mad Props Arrow. We love having you around.